sermon notes or something. <laughs> Let us throw up that, if we could. There we go. You ever watch a movie and they open a scene that gives you a introduction to the plot of the movie? It might even be a scene that occurs before you even know who's in it, before credits are there. That's what this morning is. We have a couple slides before the title of the sermon. Background information. Things that are important for you to take note of. Um, <clears throat> In Exodus 22, in the law, we see this exact message. If a man steals an ox or a sheep and butchers it and sells it, he must repay five cattle for the ox or four sheep for the sheep. Back of our bottom of verse 3, if a a thief must make full restitution. If he is unable, he is to be sold because of his theft. If what was stolen, whether ox, donkey, or sheep, is actually found alive, in his possession, he must repay double. That's one way to discourage theft. More background information. You see in 2 Kings 18, in the third year of King Hosea, Hezekiah becomes king of Judah. He was 25 years old when he became king and reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. Verse 3, he did what was right in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor David had done. He removed the high places. I want you to take note of this. He removed the high places. He shattered the sacred pillars. He cut down the Asher poles. And he broke the bronze snake that Moses had made. For Israelites burned incense to it up to that time. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord God of Israel. Not one of the kings of Judah was like him, either before him or after him. He remained faithful to Yahweh and did not turn from him, but kept the commands of the Lord, had commanded Moses. Now as we read this paragraph, the background of this morning's message this is a kind of a, a spiritually minded guy. He's, he's got a head on his shoulders to seek after God. Now, if you read about his kingship, he might not be the brightest pencil in the box or the sharpest pencil in the box, brightest bulb in the pack. He did some things that we would call probably not the wisest in his kingship. He has some things in there. It's like, hmm, I'm not so sure I would have done that if I was in his shoes. But this paragraph is very complimentary to Hezekiah. It gives him righteousness. And you've got to understand this. There are not many righteous kings in the Bible. Trivia question for you guys. I'm hoping that you, I've got you farther along. How many good kings of Israel were there? Of Israel, the northern tribe, tribes. Well, I'm, if if we get enough repetition, hopefully you'll remember. How many good kings of northern Israel? Patty says one. What's your vote been? Two. Anybody else? Sanford, your vote's one. Got a follower over there. Anybody else? Zero. Zero good kings of Israel. 
All of them are graded on the scale of what Jeroboam did. None of them fixed what Jeroboam did. So they were all evil because they did what was evil in God's sight as Jeroboam had done. What's that? Well, there's a lot of repentance, but none of the, none of the scripture says they were good men. And then we get to Judah, and the number of good kings in Judah is a single-digit number. A single-digit number. Hundreds and hundreds of years of kings, and it's a single-digit number. Here's one of them. Hezekiah's one of them. All right, so now we get to the substance of this morning's message. Now, I struggled with the title. I did. I struggled with the title. So take this title as a grain of salt. You know, um, we as people, in this process that we call life, there are days that are crippling. There are days that are hard to go through loss of a loved one or something substantial. There are things that are just tough. And this morning, we're going to talk about going through tough times. We're going to look at two very specific situations in the Bible with two kings and how they dealt with it. Second Samuel 12 and 2 Kings 20. Since we gave you the background on Hezekiah, we'll jump right into Hezekiah's story. Chapter 20 of 2 Kings. Hezekiah became terminally ill. The prophet Isaiah came and said to him, this is what the Lord says. Put your affairs in order. You are about to die. You will not recover. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a bad day. When somebody says, you're not going to recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, Please, Lord, remember how I have walked before you faithfully and wholeheartedly and have done what pleases you. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Isaiah had not yet gone out to the inner court when the Lord came to him and said, Go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, this is what the Lord your God, the Lord, what the Lord God of your ancestors David said. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Look, I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the Lord's temple, and I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you and this city and the le- and the city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant, David. This is one of those passages in Scripture that is philosophically a problem with certain philosophies of religion. This is evidence that repentant soul can change the hand of God. We talk about the power of prayer, but sometimes we think God does what he wants to do, how he wants to do it, and when he wants to do it, and doesn't necessarily listen to us. Here is one of the few prayers, one of the few examples that God changed his mind. He told the prophet, What's going to happen? The prophet delivered the news. And before he was out the door of the city, he returned and gave a new message. 
That is not a normal thing. It is a very unusual thing. And so, how many years were added? Take note of that number, 15, because that will be a trivia question coming up someday. Maybe even today. But he says, I will deliver you from the king of Assyria. The Syrians were the power. They were going to take northern Israel into captivity. Or had taken northern Israel into captivity. Depending on, on the timetable. Then Isaiah said, bring a lump of pressed figs. So they brought it and applied it to the infected skin and he recovered. Hezekiah asked Isaiah, what is the sign that the Lord will heal me and I will go to the Lord's temple on the third day? Hmm. He wants confirmation. That's an interesting concept. Isaiah said, this is the sign to you from the Lord. And he will do what he has promised. Should the shadow go ahead 10 steps or go back 10 steps? So again, you know what a shadow is. Let's go up here and we'll cast a shadow. All right, here's the shadow. You see, everyone see the shadow? Show of hands. All right. So do you want the shadow to go forward 10 steps or back 10 steps? And he says... Let's go back 10 steps. So imagine if I had my hand go back 10 steps. And he's like, all right, all right. All right. So, so he saw this, saw the miracle sign. It is easy for the shadow to lengthen 10 steps. No, let the shadow go back 10 steps. So if Isaiah the prophet called out to the Lord. He brought the shadow back 10 steps. It had descended on Ahaz's stairwell. Stairway, excuse me. I find it interesting when God's people ask God for proof. I've done it in my life. Yeah. Control of control the physical. I've asked God for proof in my life. I did not ask God to move the sun. My wife and I were young. Uh, God placed it on our heart to move to Wapiti. He said, I want you to go to Wapiti. I said, okay, Lord, I'll go to Wapiti. What shall I do? God said, I don't care. He said, I don't know about that. I need more. To, I, I need something. Tell me what to do. I'm going to go to college. What should I take? God said, I don't care. Said, no, that's not good enough. So I I enrolled in computer electronics. I signed all the paperwork, sent all the stuff off to, to Wapitan, did my thing. I said, okay, Lord, I have put the stuff in motion that I'm going to Wapitan. I've signed up to go to school. Prove to me that I'm doing what you want. Prove to me. I said that to God. 1030 at night. Somebody's banging at my door. I've already gone to bed. I get up and I put on my robe and I go to the door and somebody's handing me a computer. Yes, Lord. I'm going to open it. Yes, Lord. My wife has a similar story. <laughs> my wife has a similar story. But it wasn't whopping in, it was Williston. 2 Samuel 12. All right. 2 Samuel 12, and this is where we're going to dwell for the rest of this morning at. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he arrived, he said to him, There are two men in a certain city, one rich and one poor. The rich man had a large number of sheep and cattle. But the poor man had nothing except one small lamb. That he had bought. He raised it. He grew. And it grew up. Living with him and his children. Shared in his meager food. Drank from his cup. 
slept in his arms, it was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man could not bring himself to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guest. Vicky's on top of this. She knows the story. She knows where we're going. David was infuriated with the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die because he has done this thing and has shown no pity. He must pay four lambs for that lamb, as he's quoting Exodus 22. Wow. That gets a hold of you. Emotion in the king. Nathan replied, You are that man. This is what the Lord God says of Israel. I anointed you king of Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave the house of Israel and Judah. And that was, and if that was not enough, I would have given you even more. And why have you despised the command of the Lord by doing what I considered evil? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife as your own wife. You murdered him with the Ammonite sword. Now therefore the sword will never leave your house because you have despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own wife. This is a bad day. David had thought he had gotten away with it. He had thought <laughs> that he could, he had gotten away with what he had done. But there are those who are a little more alert. Hopefully the prophet is giving him that. This is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on you from your own family. I will take your wives and give them to another before your very eyes. He will sleep with them publicly. You've acted in secret, but I will do this before all of Israel in broad daylight. David responded to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Then Nathan replied to David, The Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. However, because you have treated the Lord with such contempt in this matter, the son born to you will die. Then Nathan went home. Now I don't know about you, but this is the making for a bad day. Your day was probably going around just fine before the bad news. And now you got this bad news. The Lord struck the baby that Uriah's wife had born to David. And he became ill. David pleaded with God for the boy. He fasted. He went home and he spent the night lying on the ground. The elders of his house stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he was unwilling. He would not eat anything with them. On the seventh day, the baby died. But David's servants were afraid to tell him that the baby was dead. They said, look, the baby was alive. We spoke to him and he would not listen to us. So how can we tell him that the baby is dead? He may do something desperate. 
you understand how his counselors could think this. When David saw that his servants were whispering to each other, he guessed that the baby was dead. So he asked his servants, Is the baby dead? He is dead, they replied. David got up from the ground. He washed, anointed himself, changed his clothes, went into the Lord's house, and worshiped. Then he went home and requested something to eat. They served him food, and he ate. The servant asked him, What did you just do? While the baby was alive, you fasted and wept. But when he died, you got up and ate food. Questioning how the king mourns and how the king handles stress. He answered, while the baby was alive, I fasted and wept because I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let him live. But now he's dead. Why should I fast? I can bring him back again. I'll go to him, but he will never return to me. We see two stories. Two people who, according to Scripture, sought after God's heart. Two people that were good guys. Both given bad news. Both prayed to God. One had a favorable answer. One did not. One sought to ask God to remember his works and was added how many years? Fifteen. The other, merely the, the life of his son. And that was denied. Consequences of sin are sometimes unavoidable, even when you're a believer. Even when you think you're a good guy and you deserve better, there can be consequences to your actions. How many sons of David died before? before how many sons of David died during David's lifetime? Or during, or at, at David's knowledge. This one, Absalom. We don't see a name. Absalom killed one. He raped his sister Tamar. And one of Solomon's brothers wanted to take David's concubine for his wife. Concubine is probably the wrong word, but I'm going to use that word in lieu of not having a better word to come up with. Four of them died, which is the price to pay for Uriah's death. If you think about it, David killed Uriah. David lost four sons. It, just like Exodus 22. Exodus 22, which was our first scripture. It is interesting how scripture works itself out. David took something that wasn't his to take. He paid for it in the lives of his own children. And because he did it with violence, it came through violent methods. Yes. It was after. Because this is the baby born out of the adultery.
it, it, it's an analogy for what David had done to Uriah. It's the analogy. So, or we'll use the word parable. It's an Old Testament parable. Vicky's wheels are turning. We'll give her a moment. But again, David was told because of what he had done to Uriah, his house would not be peaceful. Now, if you look at David, there was times he was running from one of his kids. His kids always wanted the throne. They plotted. Absalom had a very clever plot to take the throne from him. He ran from Absalom at one point in his life. But he also mourned for Absalom when he died. Which is for another story. As we go through our prayer life, and as we go through hard times, be aware that there are wheels in motion that God has placed in motion to get us to think about our life. To think about where things are. Again, sometimes we have great days, wonderful days. Birth of our children, getting married, graduating school. Probably I'm doing it backwards. You know, I mean, we have great days and it's fun to be alive. When we see our first grandchild and we hold that first grandchild in our hand, oh, it's so cute, it can do no wrong. Oh, but we have bad days, you know, loss of loved ones, going to, going through physical ailments, being told from the doctor there's something wrong, we need to do something. There are bad days, but there are good days. And there are bad days. But life isn't intended to be a journey that we go through, not alone, but with God with us through prayer and through fasting. But God would still want us to make good decisions, not to kill Uriah, to get something we want. Now, you got to remember, David already had the adultery. So killing Uriah was to cover it up. It wasn't to get the woman, which he took as a result of that. But it was to cover up the affair, the adultery. And when he could not... The prophet had to step in and give David give David the knowledge that his hidden sin is not so hidden. And what he tried to hide would be made exceedingly public. So just keep that in mind. Don't try to hide. Because what is hidden can be made exceedingly public. All right, so it's okay to pray. It's okay to fast. We should pray and we should fast. Don't be surprised if God is working off a different plan. Don't be surprised if there's consequences for being stupid, not doing what God wants you to do in life. How many of you ever feel like you've done something stupid and you, you, got, you got it coming? You know, so yeah, I, I've, I've done my fair share of stupid. Just ask my wife, she'll tell you. Um, I've done plenty of stupid things. Some of them too stupid to share with you. Yeah. And I'll let God reveal my stupidity to you. Yeah, all right. But again, sometimes there's painful things. What do we do with it? How do we work our way through it? Let us stand and close.